the the theme of the of the teen thing this past week was um, making your life count, and um, so um, I, I want to talk to you about that just for a few minutes tonight. Um, you know, you've heard that saying, "Only one life will soon be passed." And man, those of us that are a wee bit older, we really understand that. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We have one shot at this. And, um, uh, you know, I remember as a kid when I got my first single shot shotgun. I was 15 years old, and uh, I think that was the first gun I ever had. And uh, we lived out in the country, and man, that was a big deal. Man, I, I felt like I had been handed a million dollars when, uh, I don't know if it was my, I think it was my birthday, and uh, dad and mom brought that box out, and um, it was the only gift I got that, that year, but I mean, I, had, I, I didn't care. That was wonderful, and opened that box up, and there was my very own single shot H&R shotgun. It was 20 gauge, and um, boy, I had a lot of fun with that, and uh, made some animals uncomfortable. And um, it was really great. I just loved it. But with a single shot, you know how that works? You got one shot. You know, I've seen single shot rifles. Uh, believe it or not, some of your ultra big game rifles, like the kind they hunt elephants with, uh, a lot of those are single shot. Uh, they're such big calibers. And, you know, you, some of them you don't want to shoot more than once. And, uh, well, you've got that one shot. you got that one shot. Um, you know, when it comes to life, you want to aim well and aim high and try to be as steady as you can. And you want to make sure you're aiming in the right place. And then you want to pull the trigger. Paul said, this one thing I do. Vance Habner said years ago, he said, um, the old timers did a few things well. And, you know, one of the temptations of our age is, uh, you know, we, it's just easy to sort of get scattered all over the place. We've got so many possibilities now with the computer world and, you know, and just so many, you know, and, and the travel that's possible. You know, there's so many things that are possible now that they, they weren't possible when I was a kid. And, you know, in some ways life was a lot simpler when you just, you just, you just not so much you could do. But, you know, um, but the old timers did a few things well. It is really interesting what the devil fights against and what he tries to do. And if you pay attention to what the devil fights against, it will really help you to know what's really important. And um, you want to make your life count. So I, I want to talk to you tonight about one particular thing, and that is this. You know, the devil hates the fire. The devil hates... Um, um, you know, being on fire for God. You know, we used to we used to hear that expression a lot. You know, some usually it was a young person, usually, and we would say, "Boy, so and so is on fire for God." You remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and that whole contest was about who could bring the fire. Um, you know, the, the they had that sacrifice, and and uh, the prophets of Baal had first shot at it, and so they uh, they put that sacrifice there and. The prophets of Baal uh, made a lot of racket, and they, they uh, finally got desperate, and they were jumping up and down, and then they were cutting themselves, and they were crying out to Baal, and they cried for hours. And, of course, there's, you know, a, 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 a large group of the children of Israel. It hadn't rained in three and a half years, so there's a large group of the children of Israel, and, and, and this was a contest to see who could, who could bring fire down. In the, and, um, and the people said, the God that answereth by fire... He is God. So it was that, you know, they, they laid the condition down. We, we want to see who brings the fire. Well, the prophets of Baal, they couldn't, they couldn't bring any fire. So finally, Elijah gets, gets it, and, um, and he takes 12 buckets of water and pours it over the altar. So he's going to prove that, you know, you, you've tried to burn wet wood, some of you have, and or even green wood, and boy, it just doesn't work very well. So Elijah is going to make the conditions to where it is absolutely going to be a miraculous thing. And, of course, God likes that. Um, that's when God really displays his power. And Elijah prayed, and I've never counted it. Somebody said it 63 words, and fire fell. Um, you know, um, this, uh, this 
age that we live in, um, there's a, a lot of um, uh, foolish fire. A lot of foolish fire. People really get worked up about some really foolish things. The Bible says in Psalm 2, why do the heathen rage? It is a mark of the heathen, how they rage about certain things. And um, man, you can see it. You can see it online. You can see it in the protests. You can see it downtown, the protests that go on. And some of it is just absolutely ridiculous. And some of it's goofy. Uh, I'll never forget being down on White Ave. Of course, if you want to see something goofy, just go down to White Ave, hang down, hang around for a few hours, and you'll you'll get your fill. And uh, we were down there one one. Uh, I can't remember if it was a Friday night or Saturday afternoon. And here come this bunch of college kids, and um, they are protesting against eating pork. And so they're marching down the street and they're hollering, no more bacon, no more bacon, no more bacon. And they got pictures of pigs and all that stuff. And even, even a bunch of the lost people on the streets are going, they're going, I like my bacon. You know, you got these climate change people, you know, and they're, 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 they, they make a lot. It's, it's crazy what people buy into. And, you know, they, they want to save the earth. And you know what? I, I don't think you should be foolish and, you know, pump oil into the river. I, I think that's stupid. Uh, you know, God wants us to be good stewards of what we have. But, but this world is marked for destruction. You know, we're not going to save the earth. Uh, you know, we're, they're worried about global warming. Well, man, you ought to read about the warming that's coming. And, you know, so so global warming, you know, that's it's just just nutty stuff. And, you know, and there's, I, we could just go on and on and on and say a lot of politically correct things for our friends out there in the distance. But um, it's just absolutely foolish. And, man, they get worked up. I mean, they're screaming. They're raging. College campuses all over North America, they're waving that Palestinian flag, and they're going, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. And I mean, they're, they're zealous. Some of them are screaming. So I love these reporters that do this stuff. There's a few of them started going around and they get their microphone and they go, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. Do you know which river that is? Uh, well, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's the Ohio River, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and, you know, um, uh, do, you, do you know which sea that is? And one person says, well, maybe it's the Mediterranean. I'm, I'm not really sure. They're raging, and they don't even know what they're talking about. You know what you call that? Stupidity. Just foolish. Do you know what modern-day religious people hate about us, and the devil hates it too? He, the devil hates the fire. He or she, somebody's on fire for God, and when you hear that expression, they're on fire for God, that means they're excited, but it, it's more than excited. It means they're moving, they're zealous, they're consumed, they're, they're passionate, they're eat up with it. And usually when you hear that term, it's, it's a reference to, uh, and, and lost people don't really use that term, that's a, that's a term we use. And we'd say, wow, did you see so-and-so? They are on fire for God. And usually that means that they have now turned into a bold energetic witness. And man, they've lost their inhibitions and man, they're just ready to praise God and all they want to talk about is the Lord and all they want to do is, is go to church and go to Bible studies and they want to pray and they want other people to pray. And, and uh, you know what we say? We say they're on fire. There is a real connection to our God and fire. Um. Our God, there's nothing dull about Him. There's nothing sleepy-headed about Him. There's nothing boring about Him. Um, he is very alive, and His things are alive. Very much so. You know, we've been in Deuteronomy 33. You don't have to turn there. But you know when we started, I think it was the first message, and uh, uh, Moses starts off that passage, and he talks about when he was in the mount with God on Mount Sinai. And he says, you know, he's talking about how God gave him the Ten Commandments. And he says, he says, God gave him a fiery law. He, was, he doesn't call it that in any other place. 
Then Moses is looking back and Moses said, man, that was, that was a fiery law. In Exodus 3, uh, Moses is there. Go with me there to Exodus 3. You know what the contemporary church doesn't, doesn't like about us? I'm, and I'm talking about the, you know, the, the churches that, you know, they've got their big praise worship teams. They got the smoke. They got the lights. They got the, the black ceiling. They got, the, they got the, the, the rock band on the stage. And, and, um, and you know, they've got, their, they've got their preachers. I saw one, I saw one on, online one day. And, um, and, and he was in his skinny jeans. And they had the stage light on him. And, you know, you, you couldn't see anything except him. And literally, it's like Hollywood. I mean, he's moving across the stage and everything's black but him. And he's walking across the stage and he's sort of walking like this across the stage, you know. He's talking and he's, he's talking, you know. And, and he's sort of, he sort of, it's very entertaining. And I remember thinking, is this guy a clown or what? Do you know what they hate about us? See, that's not our approach. Our approach is fiery, and they don't like that. Look at Exodus 3. Now Moses kept the flock of, his, of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Now watch in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. He said, Moses, you, you've come close enough. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And God reveals himself to Moses there. And it's an amazing thing. And, and you know how God revealed himself as a fire? But it's a strange kind of fire in a sense. You know, uh, you, you know a lot of fires, you know, um, they'll, they'll really burn you. But you know, if you're on fire for God, you, you won't get burnt. You know, he doesn't consume what he sets fire to. It comes alive. And, and all of a sudden, Moses, he's, you know, Moses is out there because 40 years ago, he blew it and he killed that Egyptian. And he's been on the backside of the desert for a long time. He figures it's all over. And one day God says, I'm going to pay Moses a visit. And Gabriel says, how are you going to do it? He says, well, I'm, I'm going to do it in keeping with my nature. He says, I'm going to be fire. Go to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved. It, it's like God uttered his voice and the whole place starts shaking. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. You know, he, he, gets, he sees his heavenly vision and he realizes how unclean he is. And he says in verse 5, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. 
and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged. That seraphim comes in verse 6, and he has a live coal which he has taken from off the altar. You know what a live coal is? You know, you have, uh, uh, some of you have cooked with charcoal and, um, and you know, I, I, we used to do that a lot. And you, you like the charcoal and then you have to wait till it burns down and until uh, the flame, you know, at first it's a raging fire, you know, cause you use the, the lighter fluid or the gasoline or whatever you use. And, um, and you know, I always thought, well, you, you're, you, they say, wait till the stones are white. And it's ready to cook on, which is really true. You do it before then, you can really mess it up. Well, one day I did that. I had never done it in the evening. And uh, it was still daylight, but just barely. And so I get this charcoal going, and uh, it, it's flaming, you know, and all of a sudden the fire dies down. And I, I had stepped inside for a few minutes, and I come out. And you know what I saw? I saw what you never see in the daylight. When those coals are turning white, if you're in the daylight, you don't see any flame. But when it's dark, there's still a flame there, but it's nearly invisible. And those coals are at the peak of their heat. And the angel took a live coal from the altar. It wasn't a smoldering coal. It wasn't just one that was still, you know, sort of red hot. It was a live coal. And, and that live coal still had flames coming off of it. And he touches his lips and he cleanses him. You know, before the days of isopropyl alcohol and, you know, peroxide and all that stuff. You know what they did to sterilize something when they were going to, you know, maybe you were a little kid. Some of you remember this. Maybe, you know, your mom needed to pick a splinter out or something. And, and you know what they would do? They would light a match and they would put the pin, you know, in the, in the flame or, uh, or, you know, if they had to lance something, they would uh, heat the knife up in a flame. You know what the flame did? It killed all the bad stuff. Killed all the bad stuff. And Isaiah says, Lord, he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And suddenly he feels like, Lord, I, I don't belong in this picture. Lord, I'm a mess. Lord, what am I doing here? Lord, I like what I'm seeing, but Lord, I don't feel good about this. And an angel took a live, burning coal from off the altar and touched his lips. And suddenly his iniquity was taken away. You don't have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 2, you know, the, the apostles are all gathered with one accord in one place. And there's that sound of a mushy, rushing, mighty wind. And the Holy Ghost comes. And the next thing you know, it said, and there sat upon each one, Cloven tongues as a fire. Boy, you just run this thing from one end of the Bible to the other. And you know what our Lord is all about? He is all about fire. He is really all about fire. Look at Psalm 104. Psalm 104. Psalm 104, and Paul quotes this, the passage, the verse we're going to look at, he quotes it again in, um, in Hebrews. But in Psalm 104, verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment? Who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain? Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters? Who maketh the clouds his chariot? Who walketh upon the wings of the wind? And here it is. Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers, a flaming fire? Go to Judges 13, just for a moment. Judges 13, Joshua, and then the book of Judges, Judges 13. And you have the story of... Um, Samson's birth, the announcement of his birth. Go to 
So it says he maketh his angels spirits, his ministers. And, and, and that's talking about his heavenly ministers. In Hebrews 3, it references this passage. And Paul says in that, in that verse that he, he's talking about his angels, even in the second phrase. He maketh his ministers. Um, and a minister is a servant. If you minister to someone, Christ said, I, I am come as your minister. Okay. And the thought is his servants. And uh, he says he makes them like a flaming fire. Look at Judges 13. And um, in verse 15, the angel has come back for the second time to once again give the instructions about Samson. And in Judges 13, verse 15, And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thy saying shall come to pass, we may do the honor. Boy, isn't that just like man? Man wants to worship all the wrong people. And, the, and it's funny how God is. You know, God told that angel, He's going to ask your name. Don't give him your name. I picked up a crazy book on angels years ago. And I knew it was crazy. But I, but I wanted to see what I had to say. Is this thick? It is about all the names of all these angels. <laughs> and I thought, where did they get this? And it was, it was a New Age book, okay? You know, in the Bible, we only have, we only have a few names. We have uh, Gabriel and we have Michael. Uh, I don't know that any other name, angel is named. And God did that on purpose. But somehow man has discovered a zillion more names. In his, in his witchery. And, uh, you know, it's funny, this, this, this guy, he says, Man Manoah says to the angel, tell us your name. <clears throat> Verse 18, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. Now watch. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on, for it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. You know, uh, that angel, he felt right at home because God makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. You know what it says in Malachi chapter 3 about, about our Lord? It says, our God is like, you know what he's like? It says he is like a refiner's fire. You know, that's the fire. Some of you have seen the pictures in the steel mills. You know, you've seen how they can heat that, that metal up so hot that it literally becomes liquid. And the purpose of that is to get the impurities out of it. God said, that's what I'm like. He said, I'm like a refiner's fire. Amen. In Leviticus 6, there was the instructions about the altar and the Levites were supposed to maintain uh, the altars. And it says, the flame shall be burning on the altar. It shall Never go out. God said, I don't, I don't want that fire ever to go out. So day and night, at least in, as long as Israel was right with God, that fire never went out. Look at Acts 19. Acts 19. You got some people here and, and they get saved. They get right with God. And it's interesting what they do. Verse 18, Acts 19, verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which use curious arts, that's, you know, witchcraft, tarot cards, all that stuff. Many of them, which use curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. God says it's, it's a good day when people burn the things that shouldn't be in their life. I got a friend of mine, he's, he's up north. Some of you know him. He's preached here for me, and that's Arlen Hogg. Arlen was a, a uh, he, he's been, he's, uh, he was a conservation officer for years. He was an evolutionist. 
He hated Christians. Of course, many of you have heard his testimony. And I remember one day I called him, and I don't know what the occasion was, but he, he laughed. And he, he hadn't been saved real long at that time. And he said, uh, Pastor Newman, he said, do you know what I'm doing? I said, no, Arlen, I don't have a clue. He said, well, he said, um, you know, he said, I've got, I've got at least $1,000, maybe more worth of um, rock music CDs. And he said, you know, I was going to sell my collection. And he said, I got thinking. He thought, why would I sell that to somebody else and poison them? And he said, so I've got a couple guys here from, uh, at that time he was way up in near, uh, he was in, in Stony Rapids there near Brother Foth. And he said, uh, he said, I got my high pirate rifle out. And he said, we're just having fun. He said, we are shooting those things all to pieces. <laughs> you know what he was doing? He was, uh, he's going to make sure that nobody else would ever be able to use those. Look at Acts 18. You're right there in Acts 19. Look at Acts 18. There's a, a word in the Bible that you'll see fairly often, and it, it, it's the same thought, okay? In Acts 18, verse 24, and it says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. Fervent means boiling. I mean, he was alive. He was on fire. Being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. He really didn't have the whole picture, but man, what he knew, he wanted to tell. And he was zealous about it. Verse 26, and be, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. He came along and he didn't know much, but what he knew, he was excited about. And uh, he, was, he was good at telling it. And, um, and it says he was, he was fervent. You know what it says we're supposed to be in Romans 12? You know, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body's living sacrifice. And it goes down through that chapter, and it says, God wants us fervent in spirit. Fervent in spirit. And James chapter 5, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. First Peter 4, it says, have fervent charity among yourselves. You know, that's the, that's the kind of Christianity that the Lord is interested in. I, I realize a, a person can, um, you know, get away from the Lord and, 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 and lose that. And I, I realize when I say this, I realize not everybody is necessarily loud and bombastic and, you know, wired for 220. I understand that. But you know what keeps us going? You know the kind of Christianity, I'm telling you, the kind of Christianity that is our Lord's is alive and it's on fire. You know why? Because that's who he is. I mean, it, 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 you know, I, I realize not every day is the same. Some days are mundane. We have dark days. We have days of trial. We have days we're not feeling good. But, you know, every real believer in Jesus Christ, there's something God puts in their heart, and they get saved, and there's just something that begins to happen, and they, wanna, they want, there's a longing, there's a want to that comes into their being. It came the day they got saved, and you know what they want to do? They want to tell people. They want to talk to people. They want to talk to the Lord. They want to read the Bible. There's just a want to there. And, um, and, and that's from the Lord. You know, you get a Christian and you get him in the right place and you get him some encouragement and it's as natural as breathing for them to be on fire and be excited about the things of the Lord. I had a friend of mine in Bible school, and I've told some, I'm only going to tell a piece of this one because you guys have heard um, about this guy before, but there's just a piece of this. that There was a guy that was instrumental in my salvation, and um, he was about six foot two. His name was Kevin Weinmiller, and uh, I hit Bible school, and uh, the, same, the same year I hit, I was 18, I was fresh out of Bible school, fresh out of high school, and um, there was a guy that he was about 25, and he was zealous for the Lord, and um, he had written a track about his life. He had, you know, the before and after picture. Before he got saved, he was a pothead. And you could see it. Um, you know, that was before the day when it was fashionable and they had stores everywhere, you know. And he, he was a real live pothead. And um, 
Uh, yeah, I would, I'm, I'm just going to say is I, I went to school with some of those guys. Oh, pastor, don't you understand how therapeutic? Oh, I saw how therapeutic it was. Oh, yeah. And I know what you're going to say. Some of you have swallowed the devil's line, hook, line, and sinker. And you're going to tell me about, you know. But some of us weren't born yesterday, and we weren't fed on the media. And I remember a guy I went to high school with, man, he smoked pot like a madman. And I remember his red face and his bloodshot eyes and, and his being brain dead at school. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a wonderful thing, is it? Mm -hmm. You haven't been around much. Mm -hmm. There was a big meeting at the hospital when my, my daughter Elizabeth volunteered there. And uh, Elizabeth worked in the, um, the unit... I forget what it's called. You guys know, but it's it's that unit where you have a, a lot of people in the last stage of their life. And um, they had a big meeting because they were about to introduce um, marijuana as a therapeutic use for these people that were dying. And um, a lot of the medical people were not happy because with all of that comes paranoia and a host of other issues. But, you know, good old media and good old fearless leader and everything else behind it. You know, sometimes we're not a very smart generation. I think how I'll get off on that. My friend, his before and after picture. You know, his before picture, he had uh, cute, blonde, curly hair down to about here. And he's got this goofy grin on his face. And he looks, you know, he looks like a pothead. And, um, and, and he's got his before picture, and then he tells the story of his salvation, and he's got the after picture. Man, I met him way after. Well, 25, that's not way after. It was seven or eight years after. Man, that guy was always memorizing Scripture. He was witnessing to people. He just, and I'll, I'll never forget one day, this was him. This was Kevin. Kevin was on fire. And you know why it led to my salvation? Because I hung out with Kevin. I like Kevin. Man, my dad got saved when I was six. I grew up in this stuff, and I liked it, but it was empty, and I could never figure out why. Just couldn't figure it out. I'm with Kevin one day, and um, when I was around Kevin, I realized that what he had and what I had were two different things. And I came to a place where I wanted what he had. One day he says to me, Brother Joe, I don't know why we, why we connected. He was across the hall from me, but, but we really connected. And, and, uh, and he said, uh, Brother Joe, he said, let's go down to the public school. The school lets out in a few minutes. He said, I've, I, I've got a few magic tricks. This was Kevin. He was always looking for a way, a new way, a neat way to tell people about Jesus. He said, I got some magic tricks. He said, we're going to gather a crowd. Kevin was good at gathering a crowd, and he was, he was pretty crazy. And uh, we went, and sure enough, here come these public school kids out, and he says, hey, kids, who wants to see a magic trick? And, man, in, in seconds, we had 30, 40 people standing there. And Kevin starts off, you know, and he's got this black ball, and the black ball is sin, you know, and he's got this red hanky, and the red hanky is is the blood of Jesus Christ. And I can't remember how he did the whole deal. But, you know, he takes the, the black ball and he covers it with the red hanky. And then all of a sudden, the ball is gone. And he was talking about how Jesus Christ takes your sins away. And, man, all those public school kids, they're just, they're just in awe. That was Kevin. He was on fire. I'm just telling you. You know, when God starts stirring something in your soul and, uh, um, you know, and he's, he's moving you to do something for him, uh, that's him. That's him. You know what you have to do with the fire? You got you to feed the fire. You know, we used to have a wood stove way up north and, and uh, you know, you would, uh, you would fill that wood stove right before bed and you'd, you would get that stove red hot that we did. Get it red hot. And then you, you close the bottom door, you close the damper, and then you're good for about six hours. So it gets you pretty well through the night and maybe seven. And the next morning you open that thing up 
And the stove is, it's no longer red hot. I mean, you can put your hand on it. It's warm, but it's not, not putting off much heat. But there's some coals there. And you know, you know what you got to do? You got to feed that fire. You got to throw some more wood on it. You feed the fire. You know, a lot of God's people, they remember those early days of being saved. And they think, oh, I, I remember that. Boy, I was so excited. You know, well, well, I guess I've just gotten older now. No, no, no. And I, guys, I understand. I understand. You know, a 15-year-old, a 20-year-old that's on fire, you know, I understand. You know, they're, they're just going to have energy that, that, you know, some of us don't have. But, but if you're not careful, you'll think, you'll think, oh, I guess it's just normal that I don't have much fire now. So let's distinguish fire from energy. You're not going to have the energy of a 20-year-old, okay? But that fire, what did the Lord tell the Levites? He said, we're going to put fire on that altar. He said, it shall never go out. You know, I think there's a lot of God's people, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and they're not, there's some of them that are 30 and 40, and, and, and you know what? There's not much fire there. They remember when there was. But there's not much fire there. And you know what they did? They just thought that as they cooled down, they just thought that was normal. I told the kids at camp, you know, all these young kids, you know, they're just, they're just crazy. They're just fired up, you know. And, um, and they're excited and they're just, they're ready to ride the wave and they're ready for the challenge. And I said, some of you kids are going to go home. And I said, here's what's going to happen. I said, I hope not, but maybe your mom or dad or some adult's going to, they're going to head pat you. And they're going to go, oh, that's so cute. I remember when I was like you. And I said, it's, it's going to knock the wind out of you because it's going to be insulting. I said, but just remember, what you got is what God gave you. And it's never supposed to go out. It, they lost it because they didn't feed it. How do you feed it? God said in Jeremiah 23, is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord? You know, it's a lot of things you can do, but the word of God will feed that fire. Amen. Look at 1 Samuel 3 real quick. 1 Samuel 3. Feed that fire. You know, if you'll read the Bible, and I mean, you'll open it up and and you'll say, Lord, speak to me. And here's the, here's the thing. You know, you, you, you know, I don't know how many hours you, you spend on, you know, in front of the computer or whatever you do. And I know some of you work on the computer. That's necessary. But, but boy, it makes a difference when your Bible reading becomes significant. You know, I remember this thing when we were kids. They would say, you know what? Try to spend 15 minutes with God. Well, you know, we were kids. We didn't know any better. They told us that, you know. And, and, and you know what? I guess 15 minutes is better than nothing. But all of you that are married in this room, you know, it, it, it'd be pretty bad if, 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 you know, you just said, well, honey, here's your 15 minutes. You know, uh, you know what's going to make a difference? You know how the Word of God is going to make a significant difference in your life? Is when the Word of God becomes significant. And I don't know what that means for you. Maybe it's three chapters. Maybe it's five. Maybe it's ten. And it doesn't take near as long as you think. But you start reading and you read enough that it becomes significant. And it won't be long. And you'll feel something start burning in your heart. Jeremiah said, Jeremiah said, Thy word was in my bones like a fire. Like a fire. Look at 1 Samuel 3, verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in the days. That means it was valuable. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place. And his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out. In other words, before. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel. You notice verse three. It says, "Before the lamp of God went out." Now, this is not the altar. This is the lamp. This is the golden lamp there in the in the in the tabernacle. You know, you don't have to turn there, but if you go to Leviticus twenty-four verses one through four, he talks about that lamp. And God says, when you light that lamp, he said it in verse 2, 
He said it in verse 3. He said it in verse 4. He said that lamp is to burn continually. It was never supposed to go out. Never. I've got a book at home by uh, J.C. Ryle, and J.C. Ryle was uh, you know, a great preacher of the 1800s. And um, in 1868, he wrote a book. And he wrote a book about what had changed the whole face of England in the 1700s. He said what kept England from becoming like France. You know, France had that period called the French Revolution, and I don't know much about it, but apparently it was an extremely bloody, horrible revolution. And they said the same thing was about to happen in England. But what stopped it was the preaching of a few men who traveled all over that countryside. Of course, you know, you had George Whitfield, you had the Wesleys, you had a few others. Just a handful of guys. And so J.C. Ryle writes this book. Uh, he said it was one of the darkest times in British history. He said there were churches, and he said, but the main church was the Church of England. And he said it had reached a point where most of their preachers, if you want to call them that, he said all they did was hunt and drink liquor, and carry on, and gamble. He said they were a sorry lot. And he said that's all there was. But he said under God, he said suddenly something happened. And he said there were a few men in a few different parts of the country, and they were not wealthy, they were not connected, they had no plan, there was no organization, they weren't from some school. And he said, but God stirred them. And they were believers and they began to preach one set of truths. And it's the same truths that we believe. And they began to preach them. And he said this, they taught them in the same way with fire, with fire. He said that little spark became a steady burning flame and a candle was lit of which we are now enjoying the benefit. He said these guys preached fervently and directly. They proclaimed the word of God with fiery zeal like men that were thoroughly persuaded that what they said was true and it was the utmost to your benefit to receive it. They spoke like men who had a message from God to you and they spoke like they had to deliver it from you and they must have your attention while they delivered it. Now, J.C. Ryle is saying this in 1868. And he says, what is the problem today? He said in 1868, he said, our preachers today, they are neither so full nor so distinct, nor so bold, nor so uncompromising as those men. And they are afraid of strong statements. Do you know why the contemporary church hates churches like ours? Now, now they, I say that. They, they're not going to tell you they hate, but they, they don't like it. Do you know why? They're afraid of strong statements. You know, when, when people are on fire for God, they're not afraid of strong statements. He said, the preachers of today do not have the intensity or the fire of the last century. Look at John 5. We are almost done. John 5. John chapter 5. I don't know what your Christian friends are like. And, uh, you know, again, I, I guess I could really be misunderstood. And I, I know there's extremes. Okay, we understand that. But all that said, you know, there is something about modern day Christianity. And even in our camp, there is something about a bunch of them that they really don't like when you draw lines and you're black and white and you believe what you believe and you're not backing down. Now, you can be kind and gracious, and you should, and our Lord was, but whoa, he wasn't going to back down. And he was going to preach the truth, and he was going to call out the pretenders. You know, I don't know who you hang around. I don't know who your friends are. But... um. 
Don't let anybody kill your fire because if there's one thing the devil hates, the devil doesn't mind if he can calm you down. Boy, I, every once in a while I get in a conversation and, you know, being, and, and you guys know, I, I don't, I'm not like this in personal conversation, but every once in a while I get a little intense and I'll get talking to somebody and, and, you know, and, and I, I can just, I can see it coming. I'm thinking they're going to try to tone me down. I'm not talking about fighting over nonsense. I'm not talking about that. But if what you believe is true and if it's right and God's put it in your heart and you've got a line that they don't have, but, and, and, but you don't want to cross your line, but they're trying to tone you down. Just smile and be sweet, but don't let them kill your fire. Because there is an imp from the bottomless pit. He knows his future is fire. And he hates the fire. He hates the fire. John 5, verse 32. It's just amazing how it shows up wherever you look in the Bible. John 5, verse 32. Jesus is speaking. And in John 5, 32, he said, There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, John the Baptist, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He, John the Baptist, was a burning and a shining light. You know what Jesus just said? He was on fire. And Jesus said there had not arisen a greater then Jesus said, I like this guy. He is on fire. Look at Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Look at verse 16. Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He says, let your light shine. Now, what, what does he mean by that? Okay, was he, was he holding up a flashlight? Did he, did he pull out his Coleman flashlight? All right, guys, let your light shine. Was it a light bulb? Did he pull out a lamp? And, you, know, you know where all their light came from? All of their light came from? It came from a flame. All of it did. You're right there. Look at verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth Light and all that are in the house. And then he says, let your light shine. You know where, you know, he's talking about your light and mine. And that light is a flame. You know what? Is there no flame? Is there no fire? Then there's no light. People say, let your light go sh so shine. You know, well, that just means I just, I just need to be a nice, good example. Well, sure, it, it does mean that. But that's not really what he's saying. He's saying, you know what? He said, when they see that you believe what you believe and it's, it's fiery and it's lighting up your world and you're, you're passionate about it and it's the light that comes from God, he says, you know what? He said, it's going to shine in the darkness. It's going to shine in the darkness. The devil hates the fire. So really tonight, what I want to do is, I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. You know, there's something about our world. There's something about the media. Isn't it funny? They can all be so loud and brassy and ugly and public about their, their cause. But boy, they sure want us to be calm. I'm just telling you. God says, no, that's all backwards. He says, I put fire in your heart when I saved you. He said, feed that fire, man. Get in that book and, and, and just get around people and do things that feed that fire. 
and let your light shine, man. Don't let the devil steal your fire. And if the fires went out, got good news? It's, it's, it's not hard to relight it. it it's, it's still down in there somewhere. You, you've probably got this weak coal down in there. And you know what? I just ask God. I'd say, Lord, would you breathe on that coal again? You know what we used to do to get the fire going? We'd open that wood stove up and it'd be about out and we'd throw some paper in there and, and we'd... You know what it says God did to Adam? He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul. You know what happens in Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones? Ezekiel prophesies, but there's still no life. And then he says, prophesy to the wind. And that wind was the Holy Ghost. And they came alive. I want to encourage you tonight. Don't let anybody steal your fire. And if it's burned low, why don't you go to the Lord? And say, Lord, I, I want you to help me. And Lord, I want to get this thing going again. Let's pray. Lord, bless your truth. And that, Lord, it's a simple truth. And Lord, help us. Lord, there could be a bunch of things that are sort of putting out our fire. And, and Lord, you know what those are. Lord, I pray that you'd help all of us. Lord, that we would let our light shine. Lord, that we would, Lord, that really more and more we would be a bright light for you. Lord, that we, I pray that this church would be like what you said about John the Baptist, that he was a burning and a shining light. God, help us. Help us in our families. Help us, Lord, in our day-to-day -day life. Lord, help us to be burning and shining lights for you. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed while the organ, while the piano plays, if God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to him? You say, what's God's will for me? Well, I know part of his will, and that would be that you would be on fire for him.
Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. And uh, Lord, bless this truth to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.